Hello, and welcome to On the Marie Curie Couch, the podcast that aims to break down taboos and start open, honest conversations about death and dying. I'm Jason Davidson. I'm a social worker by profession, and I've worked in palliative care, hospice care, and bereavement support services for more than a decade. Each episode, we'll be speaking to a well-known guest to find out about how they feel about their own mortality and how their personal experience of bereavement has shaped the way they live their life. Today, I'm on the Marie Curie couch with Stephanie Hurst. Born in Barnsley, Stephanie's an award-winning radio and TV broadcaster who's got more than 30 years' experience on the airwaves. Stephanie's also presented both ITV and BBC TV shows and has written for national newspapers. She currently hosts the Stephanie Hurst Show on BBC Radio Leeds and her Kitchen Belters Facebook DJ sets get more than 100,000 views each week. I'll be talking to Stephanie today via video call. Stephanie Hurst, welcome to the Marie Curie Couch. Thank you very much, Joe. It's a nice couch as well. It's comfy. <laughs> How are you doing today? <laughs> I'm good. Well, I've I've had a you know obviously we're talking about um, uh, loved ones and people passing and stuff and how we deal with mm. it. And mm. my dad on the recording of this today, which is 29th of October, my dad is 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 due to pass from from bowel cancer. I lost my mum to pancreatic cancer. Uh, in 2013 and um and my dad is well it's it's imminent so um so yeah so it's uh, I guess the the topic that we're about to talk about today is very I guess prevalent and very front of my mind I guess really as I'm about to go through grief all over again. Can we start Stephanie by talking about your mum's death and could you could you tell us a bit about that? Yeah well that was um that was pancreatic cancer and that was something that my mum had always had. She'd always had trouble with the tummy. She'd had gallstones out in the seventies, which weirdly she kept. Like they were upstairs in in a drawer near a wardrobe. She kept they they gave them back in the seventies or something like that. They they gave you them in a test tube. Yeah. I remember like rattling these gallstones around. She went, "These are what's come out of t- mummy's tummy," and I'm shaking these things. And uh, when she did pass away, she'd kept them. So. They- <laughs> They were in like a shoebox or something like that. But um, yes, yeah, so she'd always had trouble um, with the tummy and then she'd had the gallstones removed. They'd left some in. So she had to have more taken out in the early 90s or late 80s or something like that. But her tummy had never been right. And then she was persistently just having trouble with it. And she went to see a GP several times and stuff like that. And they just told her that it was irritable bowel, irritable bowel, irritable bowel over and over. It wasn't. It was pancreatic cancer. And it's one of the hardest to detect as well, isn't it? And it's it's a bit of a, it's a silent killer, that one, of all the cancers. And um, yeah, she deteriorated quite quickly. And uh, because my mum was, um, she was only 62 when she passed. And she was a, she was a real character, my mum. She was, uh, she was from a place in South Yorkshire called Grimethorpe, which if you've seen the film Brassed Off, with uh, Ewan McGregor, it was filmed. That's the village, and it's uh, that's. I mean, it's, it's set in the fictional town of Grimley, which is Grimthorpe. But that was when my mum was was born and raised, Grimthorpe. And um, yeah, she was a she was a fierce cookie. You know, you, you didn't mess with her. And uh, I think that's where I get a lot of my strength and determination from, and stuff like that. That a lot of that comes from my mum. Mm-hmm. Um, and she fought pancreatic cancer with strength grit determination um a partner at the time because she she'd split from my father some years before um a partner james actually who himself died from cancer recently sadly and um he cared for her unbelievably and i obviously did my bit as well um but she was um she fought it as hard as she possibly could. She didn't want to die. She was out on a weekend party, my mum. I'd go out with my friends on a Saturday night in town and my mum would be in the same pub as well. And um, she was just, uh, she was just amazing. So uh, yeah, she went far too soon. 62, bit rubbish. Yeah. 
can I ask, um, Stephanie, one of the sort of aims of this podcast is to encourage people to have conversations about death and dying. And I just wondered what kind of conversations when your mum was ill, so when she had her cancer diagnosis mm. and you knew about it, what kind of conversations did you have, if any, about death and dying? Um, we were in the back bedroom uh, or her bedroom, should I say, of a of a partner's house. And uh, it was a gorgeous, sunny July day because she passed uh, on the 14th of October. And uh, this was, and I, my birthday is on the 31st of July. So it was around the time of my birthday, I think. It might have, I wonder if it was my birthday. It was around, de- most definitely, because a lot of it just becomes a bit of a blur. Yeah. And um, she turned to me and she says, I'm dying, aren't I? And at this point, you've got, you either say, no, it's going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Or you can just be really honest. And at this point, you know, the doctors had told her that um, it was incurable and all sorts of stuff like that. And I think she was just asking me outright. And I just said to her, and I held her hand and I just said, yeah, you are. And she says, I know I am. I just needed to hear it from you. Um, and that was, that was a difficult moment. Yeah. Whereas with my dad, there seems to have been a bit of denial about it all so far. And my dad is now, because of the morphine and everything like that, really, I mean, he's, he can barely communicate at all. So, um, see, there's not been that kind of conversation. I, th- I think that he, th- up until the morphine really kicking in I, I don't think he could uh I think he thinks that we didn't know for some reason or whatever but my mum she asked me outright and I'm I'm glad that I said that to her I'm glad I had that conversation I'm glad she mm. asked me and 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 I said uh and I said yeah yeah you are and it's so difficult to be so honest in that situation I think that's what people really struggle with because yeah. the natural the natural response is to want to protect isn't it and and say you know no everything is going to be okay even when you know it isn't yeah yeah even when you know it's not going to be okay and it's um and the end is nice so to speak you uh it's have it's being honest and I guess I guess that's the strength that I was just talking about with my mum the fact that you know she had grit determination and fight within her and she clearly passed that on to me as a daughter and um yeah I think that's where I got that strength from to be able to have that conversation with her it was difficult hardest conversation I've ever had to have in my Mm. life I guess where was your mum when she died was she at home hospital she she was in a hospice actually um Barnsley hospice um incredible I mean, all hospice, every every hospice I've, I've dealt with or done charity work within the past or anything like that, every single one of them do an incredible job. And um, yeah, Barnsley were, were, were phenomenal. I'd had family and friends in there before. And um, yeah, the care they showed my mum my was just um, was just brilliant. She couldn't have wanted for anything. And she was only in there a matter of, she must have been in there about four or five days. She wasn't in there long at all. I got a call. I'd been with her that day, um, the majority of the afternoon, came home about 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock, something like that. And then um, I think I just sat down or made some tea or just had some food or something like that. And her partner, James, rang me and said, um, we think that she's going. We think she's about to go. And um, so I jumped in the car, got to the hospice. And as I was pulling in, she passed away. She clearly didn't want me to see it. Mm. Um, and then I had about 20 minutes with her just in, in her room and uh, said thank you for everything that she'd done for me and everything like that. I'd already said that before, and as well. I'd already, you know, had lots of conversations with her. Some of the things um, I did do and I encourage anyone to do is is record your parents because I know these days we've got smartphones and everything like that and we've a lot more a lot more um, content is recorded than ever before, really, because we've got smartphones. But um, and and I don't feel bad recording her without her knowing, um, because you know I think some people when they don't know they're recorded are a little more honest, um, and because they're your parents, you know. 
I feel like that's acceptable. I don't think it's wrong to record people under their, you know, without their permission as a rule in general. But when it's your parents and, you know, these are priceless recordings for you. The day of my birthday that year, I sat on the bed with her um, and and just asked her about my birth and everything like that. And what she felt like and how long she was in lay before and all these things. And every year on my birthday, I was born at 20 past 12. And... Um, Every year at 20 past 12, I play that recording no matter where I am. And it's about 20 minutes long and I play it every single year. It's on my phone. It's just in my voice memos on my phone. And there's a backup as well, just in case I lose my phone. But I've done that with my dad because there were several things that um, my dad really wanted me to go to go to the war graves in France. And um, gosh, it's about seven, eight years ago, something like that. And I was just busy. You know, I'd got gigs doing a daily breakfast show, events. My diary was was rammed and I couldn't make it work. And I know that that really bothered him. He wanted me to experience that with him because my dad's very interested in war and the history and everything like that. And um, when he was communicative, I, a few weeks ago, just knelt down and stuck my phone on voice recorder and, and said a lot of things that I wanted to say and you know, apologise for that. And he says, I said, you really wanted me to go, didn't you? He says, yeah, yeah, I did. I said, I'm so sorry I didn't go. I was just, you know, life just, I was busy. And that sometimes happens. And I'm sorry. So there's a lot of things I've said to my dad recently that I, I wanted to say, and I'm at peace with things that I've said now. Mm-hmm. It sounds like that's been really important for you, Stephanie, both with your mum and your dad to to say the things you might not have had chance to say mm. or, um, you know, you wanted to get in before they died. Yeah, I mean, we've always been a very, um, me and my mum were like the very similar, driven people. And my dad uh, was a musician in bands and also fixed tellies and stuff like that as a TV engineer. And um, we were always a very... Um, I mean, mum and dad weren't meant to be together, to be honest. I mean, she said back in the 60s when they got together, she only got with him because he was in a band. <laughs> so, um, you know, so they weren't, they weren't probably meant to be together at all. They were like, they were like chalk and cheese. Um, but I think they lasted a good, I think they were together 30 years or something like that, 25, wow. 25 years plus. I had a wonderful childhood. I didn't want for anything. I was raised on a council estate in Barnsley in the north of England um, raised on gravel and diesel and um, and yeah I never wanted for anything and was showered with love because I'm an only child yeah my parents were amazing but they, they probably weren't meant to be together but we did tell each other we loved each other that's that's one of the main things we told especially as I got older as well you don't particularly do that as a teenager or even in your 20s really I guess I think it, yeah I was mid late 20s before I started telling my parents that I loved them again and I told them every time I spoke to them that I loved them and all sorts of stuff like that. So there's never been anything which has been unsaid, I guess. And I urge anyone who's listening to this today, if there's anything unsaid, um, you don't know what's around the corner, do you? Especially in these strange times that we live in right now. Had your mum talked about um, her funeral and what she'd wanted? or? Yeah, yeah. Um, no one was allowed to wear black. Uh, you had to dress as if you were going out on a Saturday night. And it was brilliant. And the church was packed. Um, there were people standing at the back. Um, I can't remember the songs we played now. Tina Turner, the best standard funeral song. Um, Shakira and Hips Don't Lie, <laughs> uh, which was her and a partner, James's favourite song. They like dancing to that. I gave the eulogy. And probably tried to make it as funny and as moving as I could. Take people on a journey throughout a life. It was an amazing day, actually. Tried to make it as, as as beautiful, as poignant, as uplifting. And and I guess a funeral is a it's a celebration of someone's life, isn't it? And it was hard. Of course, it was hard. You know, you'd you'd had these conversations, so she yeah, said yeah. what she'd wanted. This was all her wishes. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we'd, uh, we'd talked about it. She says, I don't want this to be a morbid affair. <laughs> uh, I want it to be a celebration of my life. How great. And it was, and I think we, we um, I can close my eyes now and see the church 
Um, it wasn't the, the, the biggest of churches, but it was absolutely packed. And um, yeah, I just remember it being uplifting. And mm. everyone dressed as if they were going out on a Saturday night. And then uh, there's a pub across the road. And uh, yeah, stuck on a stuck on a free bar, and everyone got drunk. <laughs> and it was a great. It was a great. We gave her a great send off. A great send off. It's so good. Uh, it's you know, not everybody's able to have those conversations, and so not everybody makes those plans. No, either. no. Or well, some some people leave us unexpectedly, and I think that's when it's even harder. Um, I guess I've been lucky in some respects. I'm glass half full, so I try and turn things on on their head and, and try and see the positives in in everything. I've been able to have conversations um, with my parents. Some people, some people go off to work in the morning or or head out and never come home, and they never get to have those conversations. And that must be unimaginably hard. And I send my love to those who have been through that because that is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I count myself as very lucky that I've been able to have these conversations with my parents before they passed. I think there are also people who, where death is anticipated and even still, they're not able to have those conversations. And I wonder whether, I wonder whether you've been able to have them with your mum and dad, because, um, you know, it's something that it, it, it's been kind of it's felt open and comfortable enough in the family. So that's something you can do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've respected my stepmom's wishes in having the conversation uh, with my dad when he was, when we could communicate with him. Mm -hmm. And um, she's found it difficult to have that conversation with him. Um, you know, if, if he, if he did ask her, she didn't know what she would say, but she'd deal with it at the time. I mean, every day I go and visit my dad um, and I'm guessing by the time I hear this podcast and it's published, of course, we're recording it today, but by the time I hear it, he'll no longer be with us. Um, but every time I go and see him, it's like I'm saying, I'm saying goodbye every single time. I, I, I you know, it's, I don't know when it's going to be. It's, it could be today. It could be tomorrow. It could, who knows? It's, it's imminent. Um, but I, I feel at peace with having the conversations that I've had with him. And I have said to him, Dad, it's okay. Stop fighting this. It's okay. You can go. Mm -hmm. You know, you wouldn't put your dog or your animal through through what he's going through. It's a very slow, awful way to go. And, um, and you know, personally for my dad, um, I think it's been a difficult battle for him because he... he as lots of men are, and I think, I think this is why we probably need more awareness with bowel cancer as well. Um, I mean, there's a lot of awareness as it is, but even more so, talking about it as much as we can to to kind of drive it home that you've got to use those bowel testing kits at sixty and, and get checked out because he didn't and uh, and ignored two of them, and this is the reason why we are where we are today with his health and um, just through through fear. I think, um, which is which is sad and awful, and you know I can't attack him for that at all because we we're all fearful of certain things in life, and it just so happens that my dad's fear came from from dealing with things directly uh, attached to his health. You said before there was there was some denial around your dad's illness from yeah, from him. Yeah. And do you think do you think that's cause of fear? Oh, massively, yeah, yeah, massively fear. Yeah, and, and anxiety as well. Um, I never remember my dad being anxious, but as, he, as he's got older, 72, as he's got older, he's definitely, especially in his late 60s, developed anxiety. I think a lot of it comes from that. Um, but he's of that baby boom generation where lots um and i know just just this is me only from talking from friends about their parents as well because we're all of that age in our 40s mm -hmm. now where our parents are in the 70s or late 60s and um and denial and fear and all sorts of stuff because it's a generational thing where they didn't talk about such things like that whereas now we're 
as a society, we're much more open, aren't we? We're much more open to how we're feeling and, and we talk more and we're encouraged to talk more as well. We should talk more about our mental health and and how we're feeling um, because this, you know, it's it's all well and good taking yourself to the gym and making your body look great, but it's this thing inside our heads. And that's the muscle as well, the grey matter. You've got to look after that. Um, so I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of, um, of talking about things because I think it's important. Your dad, is he at home? Yes, he is at home. And that was his wishes. He didn't want to go into a hospice or anything like that. And I think with COVID and everything we're living through now, it would be very difficult for visiting and all sorts of stuff like that. So, um, and I must say the NHS team and, and Millen and all the nurses and the care and everything that he's received has been absolutely firsthand. It's been incredible. Absolutely incredible. Again, go above and beyond. If my stepmom Joan wants anything or needs anything, she she's a phone call away and they're they're there within twenty minutes, half an hour, an hour max. And um that's truly incredible, isn't it? Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. I'm just I'm wondering what is helping you right now, you know, what's keeping you going with coping with your dad's illness and impending death um i think i um i've got a lot of amazing friends who check in mm. um one of my really close friends she sent me a little um care package the other day a little happiness package with a love heart in it and all sorts of stuff like that and that just arrived and that was lovely thanks deb um yeah, um, lots of my friends, I don't want to be naming everyone like that because I don't want to leave anyone out, but everyone's, you know, calling and, and texting me and WhatsApping me and making sure I'm okay and checking in. Because I do have, and I not wanted to contradict myself, I do go to ground a little bit. Mm. I do, when things like this happen, I tend to head down, <laughs> keep calm, carry on. But I, I, I yeah. The people may not hear from me for a few days or a week or something like that, and they go, "Is she okay?" I think because I just, I you know, I just got to get on with it, and I take my brain off to a different place. And maybe we all have our own little ways of dealing with with grief or when life turns upside down. And I guess that's one thing I've learned about myself as I've got older is the fact that I really do go to ground a little bit. So I've got friends checking in, <laughs> poking me. She all right? Come on. <laughs> Which is, you've got to take care of yourself. Um, I remember when my mum passed away and um, I was being strong. I did the eulogy and also, I mean, I've got that to write for my dad, of course. And I've got that because as, as an only child, I've got that to deliver. And I'm guessing, not that the family would expect it, but as a broadcaster and a presenter and a host myself, I think they would expect me to get up and say a few words because I'm used to being in front of, of people. And um, I remember speaking at my mum's funeral and I've, I've, you know, whether it's, you know, the largest crowd I've been on stage in front of is what, 75, 80,000 people several right. times. It's a, lot. it's a lot of people. But then I've been in front of a, a small selection of people and everyone says it's the, I, I, there's no difference to me in front of whether it's 75,000 people there or, or there's three or four. And I, I did treat speaking at my mum's funeral like a gig. Like I'd been booked to go and talk at an event. To be able to do it. To be able to do it. You've got to, you've got to put yourself in that headspace. And I know other friends that have spoken at, at, at friends' uh, funerals and delivered eulogies and stuff like that. They've had to kind of pop them. This is an event that I've been booked to go to. At that point, just before you get up, once, you, once you've got down, that's when you can start to, I guess, really deal with where you are and uh and everything that's happening but i do remember a, a few weeks after the funeral i cried so hard i guess that's not one thing i've spoken about yet is it crying um i cried so hard so hard that my eyes were puffy for days i really sobbed my little heart out it's funny when grief is because it can be a couple of years afterwards can't it it can mm -hmm. Grief doesn't hit straight away. It's a process that we have to go through. And I guess every time someone leaves us, life becomes a new normal, doesn't it? I guess in some respects, in the fact that, you know, things will never be the same. Once my mum left, things were never the same. But I also drew strength from the fact that my mum lost her mum. 
And her mum lost her mum. And her mum lost her mum. So on and so forth. Mm. And they laughed again. And, you know, my mum... My mum lost her dad at a very young age, my granddad. Um, I never met him. He died a couple of years before I was born. And he died suddenly at, at 47, I think, or something like that, from a heart attack. So, and my mum had... They they were like, I mean, they were chalk and cheese, my granddad and, and my mom, her dad. Um, but they'd started to rebuild their relationship a little bit. And uh, they were just starting to get to know each other again. Um, and, and then he died. And I know my mom found that particularly difficult. And I had a brother who, who sadly passed away after half an hour of his lungs collapsed. He was born slightly premature. I mean, these days he would have he would have survived. And I know my mum found that particularly hard as well, especially so when she was walking down the street and people that had seen her pregnant um, would ask how the new baby is. That was particularly difficult for my mum. And so much loss for her in a short space of time. Yeah, yeah. She'd lost her dad and then then she lost my brother as well. That was quite that was quite something. And I did in my recordings of my mum when she was about to pass, I did ask her about all of that. And how she dealt with that. And, and and I drew a lot of comfort myself from, not in a selfish way, but just to hear her speak about that and how she dealt with it. And I guess they're life lessons that we can learn from our parents and how to deal with things. So, yeah, so grief does come in funny old ways. And I found myself, you know, it was a few weeks afterwards. I really cried my eyes out and, um, and I was fine after that. But it becomes a new normal. And I guess once my dad passes that then will become a new normal. It's then I'll be an right. orphan. I can join the orphan club. I'm joking. That's that me means... trying to turn it on its head again. That's me trying to kind of find positives in all of this, I guess. Uh, well, adding some humour as well, you know, and I think yeah. kind of not everything stops, does it, when this is happening? Not at all. The coronavirus pandemic has triggered a wave of bereavement across the country and taken away our ability to be with loved ones and grieve in traditional ways. Marie Curie's new Memory Cloud is an online space to reflect on a loved one's life and share special memories with your friends and family. Visit memorycloud.org.uk I was just thinking back to when you were talking earlier about going to ground and how, you know, your friends were checking with you and that, you know, you might not be as sort of responsive to them. But what we talk about with, uh, you know, and I say we at work in Marie Curie and certainly people I've met who are grieving um, and bereaved, it's, it's kind of good to say to people, you know, I'll contact you, like, thank you, and I know that you're there, and when I need you, I'll contact you. And I think some people find it difficult to let people know what they need or what they don't need. And I think that thing about, well, maybe going to ground because that's how you cope and that's how you manage with things and that's what you need to do to be able to get through it. It's just about saying that to friends as well, isn't it? So you don't need to worry about me. This is just what I do and what I need to do to be able to get through it. Yeah, it's my process. This is because we all have a, we're all unique. That's why every single one of us is beautiful because we're all different and that's what makes the human race such a wonderful thing. Uh, and we all have our own own ways of, of dealing with things, our personalities. And um, yeah, going to ground is is definitely not cutting myself off, but, you know, sticking the phone on airport mode. I'm a swine for that. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, because it, it, it bongs a lot and makes noises a lot. And I'm like, leave me alone for a bit. You know, I'm fine. Nine to five, nine to five, nine to five, nine to six. But come six, seven o'clock, I'm like, I need to watch some telly or I need to have some downtime or I need to sit with a good book and read. I just need to kind of switch off a little bit myself. I mean, it's been difficult. I've not, you know, there's been no airport mode going on my phone for, since my dad's been ill because I've never known when uh, my stepmom's needed me or someone's needed me. But yeah, I can, when things are tough, you can, you can go to ground. But it's having someone to talk to as well. It's having that. It's having your friends, isn't it? Your team of people that you have around you your other warriors you can uh your tribe that's the word i was looking for yeah it's having your tribe around you to kind of to make sure you're okay 
and and for you to to be able to do that for your friends when they're in time of need as well it's important to have your tribe around you it sounds like they're some of the things that help you manage now and yeah. cope with the situation you know with your dad and also have helped you when you were grieving for your mum so you know being able to go to ground being able to switch off in the evening reading a book watching a bit of tv um and having your tribe and having your friends around you mm. is there anything else that helps you um my work i guess i can mm. um I can sit in my little studio here and um, and throw myself into work stuff. One thing that's helped me recently, and this is going to sound odd, but a friend of mine, Jonathan, who we've known, well, we've known each other since we, we worked, because I've worked in radio since I was 12 years old. I was very, very lucky to start so young, making tea for mullet-haired DJs back in the day. And Jonathan was young like me at the radio station, And uh, I guess we were thick as thieves in some respects, always in the studios, messing about and stuff. And he's cleared his garage out and he's found loads of big reel-to-reels tapes from back in the early 90s. And uh, yeah, he he dumped all these on my doorstep. It was about 20 reels. And um, that's taken my mind off a lot of things, putting them on the machine and just listening through them and transferring them digitally for him. Because each one is about an hour long or something like that. And uh, they may need a little helping hand to play because they can be a little tired or sticky or whatever. That's been good because I've been able to kind of take myself away from something or I've kind of been able to revisit the past. I always think I've got it's good to have one foot in the past, but I'm I'm firmly planted in the future. Uh, But it's always I do enjoy looking back a little bit. It's, it's been nice. To, so this has been, it's been actually, Jonathan dropping these tapes off has really helped me because it's helped me kind of put my brain somewhere else and not have to think about everything that's happening. Just sit in my studio and, and you know, transfer these tapes. And he's been doing the same with videotapes. So he's been transferring loads of old videotapes and there's loads of old footage of us from the 90s, which has been lovely actually to see again. So, um, so yeah, it's been good. So that's it. I think... I think for me, it's it's doing something I enjoy, which gives me some form of normality as well. It's interesting because what you're describing, there's also something about reminiscing. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, there's, there's, there's or it's getting old photographs and mm. digitising them, scanning them, things like that. And that's like remastering old tapes. It's like it's bringing something from the past back to life again. Mm. There's a friend of mine on Facebook who's... Um, who's into colorizing photos and there's a really there's a gorgeous one of my dad with his glasses on as a 10 or 12 year old or something like that and um i've got an original i've not got a negative of it but it's a very good original so i'm going to scan that i'm gonna ask him to colorize it because i think that'll be nice on the back of the service Uh, so i'm always i'm thinking about these things the creative brain in me i guess really so um but yeah anything like that i'm i'm all over because i think it's good i've never been one to kind of I guess, mope around. I've always, you know, yesterday morning, you know, things were st- I woke up feeling really heavy on my shoulders. And I was like, and I've not run in months because of COVID or whatever. I've not been able to go to the gym or anything like that. I thought, you know, what? I'm getting my trainers, my running gear on, I'm going for a run. And that really helped me yesterday. I felt so much, I felt I, I was tired after it. That first run back is always the hardest, but it was nice too. It was nice to run and nice to, you know, free my brain a little bit. It's just maintenance for yourself, isn't it? Yeah, and physical exercise so yeah. beneficial for mental health and yeah. for our mental health. I'm going to change direction a little bit now, Stephanie. And something we um, we ask everybody on uh, the Marie Curie couch is whether you think about your own death. Yes, um, I do. Um, I don't know if I should say this publicly. I've not got a will yet. And this is something that friends get on to me for. You've not got a well. And I go, no, I nearly did it years ago. Well, about five years ago. I think just after my mum, actually, because I'd sorted hers out and everything. And I thought, right, I need to get mine done. I need to get it done. I need to get it sorted. But I've not done it. And I've got a list of bits and pieces. And I need to, this, you know, I could head out this afternoon and something could happen. 
And it's the it's the mess I leave behind. And there's lots of loved ones I want things to go to. So I guess all of this with my dad has really made me start to think about, right, I need to get things in order because I'm in my 40s. You know, hopefully I'm around for another 40 years. Hopefully. I don't want to go anywhere. I've got a lot to live for. There's lots of things I want to do. I'm, I'm annoyingly ambitious myself. I know, I annoy myself with ambition sometimes. Um, so I'm not planning on going anywhere at all. But I do, I do worry that, you know, both parents have gone from cancer or one is imminent. I do worry that it's going to get me. And I do worry about that. I lost one of my really close friends who we'd known each other since we were 16. And um, she died from metastatic breast cancer of the liver um, about a month ago. So that's been quite hard, yeah. that actually, because Jane was only 43, a uh, wonderful husband and two wonderful children. And that's that's been, that's been quite hard because, you know, she's been in my life you know, a long time. And um, it's funny, you look back on Facebook messages and on Messenger and stuff, and it was only a week before she passed away that we were messaging each other. And the last thing I did say to her, the last thing I said, I, I love you so much. So um, I remember saying, I've got to go because I'm getting told off <laughs> for being on Messenger. We're about to watch a film. <laughs> and then that was the last time we spoke. Um you know, cancer seems to be all around us. I think with regards to the will writing, you're not alone and not having a will for sure. But it's interesting, isn't it? And I think people either don't want to think about it or think, oh, that's morbid or think, oh, it's a long way off. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we'll think about that later. And actually, it's of course, it's, you know, better to get these things done and get them written down for lots of reasons. And as you say, um, you know, it makes things a bit more straightforward when people do die, if they've got their wishes written down or they've got a will. And I think you touched on something which is really important. You said there are people who you want to give certain things to and you don't want to miss out on that either. And I think that thing about, um, you know, writing it, yes, it's probably not the easiest thing to do, but actually once you've done it, it's done. And then you put it in the drawer. Yeah, True. Yeah, I just need to, um, I need to work out to give stuff to. <laughs> you can always alter it though, can't you? Of course. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just the, the process of sitting down and looking at my estate and everything and just going, right, who am I going to give stuff to? Who do I want this to go to? And so on and so forth. So I need to, um, I need to sort that out. But I do worry that, I mean, I, I make sure I'm healthy, I eat well, I exercise, I put a lot of good stuff inside me. So hopefully, I don't think I'm going to go anywhere yet, but in answer to your question, my own death, because um, it's inevitable, it's going to happen. None of us are immortal, unless they discover something about the human race in the next 15, 20 years. We all might still be here in 100 years. Hurrah. Um, so, yeah. So, but I've, I've yeah, it's something I've, I've thought about, I guess, a lot recently with my dad falling ill with cancer and, mm. and other family members that have gone to cancer. And, and I feel that I just, it, it, it could get me. So every A campaign or twinge I get in my body, maybe it's a bean in your 40s though. Every little twinge I go, what's that? What's that? Whereas when you're younger, you're immortal, aren't you? But I think also when you're you're you have somebody who's significant in your life, somebody who you're mm -hmm. close to and they're dying or they've died, then that you know, that makes us face our own mortality as well, because yeah. death's very close and present then, isn't it? You know, and so it makes us think about our own, it makes us reflect on life and you know you were describing some of that helpful reminiscence earlier of looking at all photographs and um, you know, it's just some of those questions of well what was life about or what did he do or she do and yeah it's a funny thing isn't it but it's gonna happen to all of us can i ask is legacy something that's important to you so how you'd like to be remembered gosh how would i like to be remembered i like to treat people the way i like to be treated myself have respect mm. for others that she was a good person um i had a good heart uh 
I was passionate about radio and and things because radio is the thing that I mean I love television television's wonderful but there's nothing like the radio because this essentially a podcast is is radio it's an, it's another form of radio it's spoken word mm. and it's 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 theater of the mind and it's powerful and it's using the, the english language and that is what i adore the power of speech i love music radio but i do love the power of speech so yeah how would i like to be remembered for just being a, a good person for being a good person, someone someone could trust as well. I um, if someone tells me something, I keep it very close to my chest. Very. There's a lot of secrets inside this head of mine. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I yeah, I just want to be re- remembered as a good person. That'll do for me. <laughs> just before we finish, Stephanie, can I ask one last question? What does it mean for you to be able to? share your story with with me and the Marie Curie couch today? Um, it means a great deal because I think what we were talking about earlier with with mental health and and bereavement and, and grief and, and to be given the opportunity by yourselves at Marie Curie, which again, the incredible work you all do is just phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. So it's an honour to be here today. But... I think it's important to talk. It's important to be, I don't want to use the word inspired, but when you hear how other people have dealt with it, we all deal with it in our own ways, but you can listen to how someone has dealt with something and think, oh, well, that's a, that's a different way of looking at things. That may help me in my journey. Um, I think what I spoke about earlier with my, with my mum and the fact that someone said to me that, well, your mum lost her mum and her mum lost her mum and her mum lost her mum. And I thought, well, that's an interesting way of looking at it. And I took that and I used that myself in my own grief because I thought, well, my mum laughed again. My mum had good times again. It will be sunny again. But we have to remember those people who have left us with joy in our hearts and remember the good times. And, And they are all around us. I mean... White feathers I find around my house. And my mother, she shifts stuff. She moves stuff all the time. It's not just me forgetting getting older. I'm, I'm sure she moves stuff. And I've got yeah. on, my, um, on my kind of, not mantelpiece, but sideboard in my house. I've got my parents' engagement photo. And it's a deep frame, actually, the, the photo frame that it's in. It's a deep set frame. And there's uh, both of their wedding rings sat in there. How nice. And I was going about my business one day and I walked past it and I looked on the floor and there was a white feather directly in line with where the photo was. So the white feather now sits within her ring. So they are they, these people that have left us. We've got far too much energy as human beings. Once we leave, where does that energy go? Mm. It's got to go somewhere, hasn't it? You know, so people are all around us. Our loved ones are here and... You know, and we'll find out what that will be like and we'll be with our loved ones one day. So, yeah, if there's anything, I guess, really, it's listening to other people and their journeys and also listening to yourself as well. You know, how you get through this because it's a process, isn't it, grief? It's something we all go through and it's something that some of us deal with, not easily, but easier than others. And, uh, and those people that find it difficult will find comfort in listening to other people talk I guess really because it's all about talking you're saying that even though people you love may have died they're Mm. still part of your tribe oh yeah 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 they're still part of my tribe Stephanie Hurst thank you thank you for being so open and honest and telling lovely stories about your mum and your dad and I wish you and all the family all the very best thank you Jason So that's all for this episode of On the Marie Curie Couch. We hope it's got you thinking about matters of life and death and perhaps starting those conversations with your own friends and family. Marie Curie's here to help. 
from planning ahead to coping with bereavement. You can talk through any concerns you have around the end of life with our support line team, which also includes specially trained nurses. Call us on 0800 090 2309 or search Marie Curie online. This podcast is made by Marie Curie, a national charity that supports people affected by terminal illness. For more information and support, you can visit our website, mariecurie.org.uk. The podcast is produced and edited by Marie Curie with support from Ultimate Sound and Vision. The music featured is Time Lapse by Panoceanic. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please do like and subscribe. Thanks for listening, and until next time, goodbye.